Good morning, everyone. Good, good afternoon. Um, we're excited today to be able to sit down and have a conversation about the transnational dimensions of police violence and anti-Black police violence with an all Black women panel. And I'm particularly excited about the fact that it's an all Black women panel because it is rare that we talk about police violence and it's only Black women that get a chance to speak. And so um, I really appreciate that. And we're gonna go ahead and get started because we, we don't have an infinite amount of time. Um, but my name is Kristen Smith and I am an associate professor of African and African Diaspora Studies and Anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm also the director for the Center for Women's and Gender Studies there as well. And I am going to be your moderator for today. Um, and I have the pleasure of being able to introduce our illustrious guests. Um, who are who are each very accomplished and 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 very um, very accomplished and and very honored in their in their in, in their uh, oh, Luciana's here in in their individual trajectories and so I'm gonna now that we have Luciana Brito from Brazil on as well I'm gonna go ahead and introduce everyone and so and so our first guest is Manushka Celeste. And Manushka Celeste is an associate professor in the University of Florida's Center for Gender Sexuality and Gender Sexualities and Women's Studies Research and African American Studies Program. She holds a PhD in communication from the University of Washington, from the University of Washington. She's a Black feminist media studies and cultural studies scholar, and her recent work focuses on mediated belonging and citizenship narratives around Blackness, Black womanhood, and transnational mobility, particularly immigration and tourism. She is the author of Race, Gender, and Citizenship in the African Diaspora, Traveling Blackness which is the winner of the National Communication, of National Communication Association's 2018 Diamond Anniversary Book Award and the Association's 2017 Outstanding Book Award from the African American Communication and Culture Division and Black Caucus. Our next guest is Sandy Hudson, who is the founder of the Black Lives Matter movement presence in Canada and Black Lives Matter Toronto. Sandy also helped found the Black Legal Action Center, a specialty legal aid clinic, which provides direct legal services and test case litigation for Black communities in Ontario. She currently serves as the organization's vice chair. She's also, she's also currently studying law at UCLA with a specialization in critical race theory. Sandy also co-hosts the Sandy and Nora Talk podcast Talk Politics podcast, and she is the co-editor co of the contributed volume, Until We Are Free, Reflections on Black Lives Matter in Canada. Our next guest, Luciana Brito, or Luciana Brito, sorry, is an historian, member of the Black Women's Network of Bahia, and identifies herself as a Black intellectual and working class feminist. She's an assistant professor in the Department of History at the Federal University of Reconcovo da Bahia, Brazil. And in 2015-2016, she was an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the Sawyer Seminar, at the Sawyer Seminar Histories and Cultures of Freedom, led by Professor Herman Bennett at CUNY Grad Center. As a recipient of Fulbright of, of a Fulbright Doctoral Fellowship, she spent one academic year at New York University. She specializes in the history of slavery and abolition in Brazil and the United States. She is also interested in the areas of race, gender, and class in the Americas. Luciana is the author of several articles and the book Temores da Africa, which will soon be published in English. And our last, last but not least guest by any stretch of the imagination is Mam Fatou Nyang, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your name right. I hope that was correct. <laughs> um, Mam Fatou Nyang is an associate professor of French studies at Carnegie Mellon University. Her research focuses on race, immigration, and national identity in contemporary France. She is the author of Identités Francaises, a book that interrogates notions of marginality or marginalization and national identity through an analysis of French news. 
In 2015, she co-directed the documentary film Marianes Noirs. The Marianes Noirs. The film explores the experiences of seven Afro-French women unearthing what it means to be Black in France, Black and French. Dr. Yang is also a photographer and the author of a photo series on Black French Islam. And so welcome again to each of you. Like, as I mentioned before, it's really quite a privilege to have this kind of transnational dialogue with such dynamic and amazingly accomplished Black women. And I want to jump right into the conversation um, because I want us to be able to have enough time to be able to talk and also uh, go into questions. And so my first question to each of you is what have been some of the specific local responses to the protests in the United States or the protests around the death of George Floyd and the issues and debates inspired by them? <laughs> I love that yeah, um, <laughs> everyone's thinking. <laughs> um, is there order, the Chris? I There's think. no order. And so the, the question, so I think that maybe what we can do um, I know that you just got on the call, Luciana, and so I want to give you time uh, to set it in. Front, front will start. Front yeah, will that would be wonderful. Uh, Mom, if you could start, start that would be wonderful. So I, so I just got back in the U.S. Um, I left France yesterday. And um, so the, the, um, the images of George Floyd's death um, created a lot of shocks in France. And in the media, the coverage really take us back to this idea of, you know, we're used to see, to see this type of violence from America, but the shock really was, I mean, it was astounding to see this, you know, eight minutes and 40 seconds, 46 seconds of a person being put to death, you know, in just like this indifference that the policeman had to um, this murder. So the case was really in the French media, at least, to pinpoint to the violence of America, racism in America, and America and the, the black body. And what happened is that these protests that we saw sweeping the world also was, um, were um, an opportunity for Afro-French to question the violence, state violence against black bodies, something that we're not used to in France. We're always looking at what's happening in somebody else's garden and not taking care of our own dirty kitchen. And what happened is that, you know, um, so there, there was, there were a, um, a wave of protests in several cities, Marseille, Rennes, Lyon, but really the biggest one happened in Paris in June 2nd and was um, organized by the Comité La Vérité pour Adama, led by a woman named Asa Traoré, whose own brother, Adama Traoré, was killed in 2016 by the police. And really what we're saying in France is that that time they messed with the wrong sister because we have a long tradition of Arab and black men being killed by police. No justice is being rendered. And usually it's a sister, a cousin, a mother who creates a committee to ask for, and it's usually, you know, verite and justice, which is truth and justice for. And we have like countless uh, uh, truth and Justice Committee 4, and it's usually the name of a Black and or an Arab man. And this time they really messed with the wrong one because Asa is just a strong, strong and, you know, hard-headed woman who would not let go. And she called um, for a protest on June 2nd that was really surprising by the size. I mean, everybody was taken, was shocked by how successful, how big the, the, um, the, the protest was. And that really also signaled a shift um, and I'll be real, really brief, a shift in the media coverage that went from being extremely sympathetic and looking at the violence in America to condemning um, the parallel that were made between the two deaths. I mean, you have two black men um, dead after meeting of the police, death um, and with the same last words, I can't breathe, and whose death were at first pinpointed to be due to cardiac arrest and not having the, the, the weight of four adult men on top of them. So the the Parallels was just so striking, it was impossible for us not, not to make them. And then from there, I mean, the shift in coverage with people accusing us of being racist because we are infusing race in a conversation because you know that race doesn't exist in France and using, you know, of being dishonest, of using, um, you know, of being this bigness, this business of victimization and minority whining and mixing two cases that had nothing to do when the cases were, had everything to do, this global um, circulation of, you know, the mistreatment of black bodies. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, I'm, I'm really glad that you um, immediately went um, to Traoré's uh, cat case um, because I think that it's been really fascinating to see how local um, grassroots 
organizers who have been clamoring to speak out against anti-Black police violence for years, if not decades, um, are now harnessing a bit of US imperialism to be able to then turn the spotlight back on the home space and be able to talk about these cases that these particular nations may not want to pay attention to because they have a possessive investment in projecting themselves as non-racist, non-racialized spaces. And I think that the case in France also resonates quite, quite clearly with both Canada and Brazil. And so I wanna to turn to Sandy because I think that the conversations around Canada have been so similar. We saw Justin Trudeau get on his knees and all of Canadian black Twitter went into complete conniptions and with good reason. And so there seems to be a lot of parallels between this, this, this kind of national identity investment and being raceless and being a racial democracy in France and the same kind of investment in Canada. And then we'll go to Luciana Brito where there's the same kind of investment in Brazil as well. So Sandy, can you talk a little bit about Canada? Oh, I think you're, you're muted, Sandy. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, thank okay. you. Um, yeah, you, you are absolutely right. Um, the way that Canada constructs anti-Black racism uh, is through denial. And so, uh, you know, rather than even calling ourselves a racial democracy, like you'll see in Brazil or France, uh, Canada, and emblazoned across the headlines this week, despite the fact that there were protests in even the smallest towns in the, more, no, in the most northern cities, uh, to Toronto and Montreal, where we saw some police brutality response to Black protesters, emblazoned across our headlines were, does racism exist in Canada? Which is what happens <laughs> every single time uh, there is some sort of unrest or uprising from the Black community. And for us, at the same time um, that uh, George Floyd was murdered, um, the very next day a Black woman was killed in Toronto. Regis Korczynski Paquette, and I should say that she was Black and Indigenous. She was a Black and Indigenous woman. And um, the way that uh, anti-Black police brutality um, exists in Canada is very similar because it has a, the very same history um, as the United States. It's very similar to the United States. And so uh, we also see that same sort of uh, brutality against Indigenous people. And so when you have someone like Regis Korczynski Paquette, who is both Indigenous and Black, it's doubly, um, uh, she's doubly uh, targeted. Um, and so, yeah, we have, you know, this prime minister who seems to be beloved around the world, but people don't really know uh, what his record truly is uh, with respect to Black communities. And um, uh, this is a man who, after lots of unrest in the Black community in 2016, when um, there was uh, some um, uh, very similarly police violence against Black people, uh, where people were being killed, and uh, uh, there was Black uprisings in, in Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, uh, Vancouver. Uh, the, the Prime Minister uh, decided to allocate funding to Black communities. And that was back in 2017. To this date, uh, uh, almost none of that money has been spent. So he allocated $19 million over five years to the black community in Canada, which is nothing. That is no money, that's, that's zero, zero dollars. And he has spent, I think, 300, just over $300,000 so far. And compare that to the fact that in Canada, uh, uh, we spend federally, and so this is not all the money spent on police, but just from the federal government, $11 million a day. $11 million a day. Um, there is more money spent uh, on police uh, than the government has spent in two years on black uh, communities. 
than they have allocated at all to black. They never talked about black communities before the unrest in 2016. They finally acknowledged that anti-black racism exists, but they don't want to do anything about it, but take pictures of themselves kneeling in the streets when they're the ones who have the power to create the structural changes that we're seeking that will change the conditions of our lives. Um, and so, you know, I, I've been uh, very heartened to see uh, the uprising and organizing of black communities across, across Canada uh, in solidarity with the United States, but also in focus of, of, of uh, the killings against black people here uh, in Canada. Um, and uh, I'm very optimistic that because we've never seen such an uprising before, um, we'll be able to, uh, to change our living conditions uh, uh, through our bodies on the streets. I think that's, that's so important in such an important context. And um, I want us to, to go and, and pull in two things before we kind of move on to the next panelist. If you all could do everyone a favor, because I think part of, um, part of the, the goal of this particular panel is to help people to understand the transnational dimensions of the debates that are going on right now. And although many of us are familiar with what goes on transnationally, not everyone knows the names of the people who you just mentioned um, in, in terms of uh, the, the other people, the other Black folk and Indigenous folk um, who have been killed by the police and whose killings highlight the, the, our, our collective need to uproot white supremacy from the structures of our, our national um, powers. And so if, if you all could write um, the names of Adama uh, Traore and the names of the black indigenous woman that was just killed by police in the chat so that people can then search it um, on their own and, and be able to know and register those names. I think that would be really important. Um, and I think that, um, you know, especially when we're dealing with transnational dialogue, people don't always know how to spell things or pronounce things. And so we're going to try to be in solidarity and put those things up. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this, the case in France, the case in Canada are, are so very resonant um, with the space of Brazil. And so I wanted to go then go now to Luciana Brito and, and see, Luciana, if you could talk a little bit about um, the impact and, of, of the protests um, that started here um, on Brazil. And, and I want to actually, let me step back for a second, because I really want to make sure that we frame this correctly. I am very sensitive of the fact that we here in the United States tend only to care about what goes on elsewhere when it has something to do with what we are concerned about in the moment. And so what is really, I, I, I don't like starting with the question, how does everybody else in the world respond to whatever's going on here? Because the fact of the matter is, we should be having conversations about how all of our situations are resonant to one another mm -hmm. and how we all need to be paying attention to one another. But this is in the inter interest of education and dialogue and bringing people into that particular awareness. And so we're starting with the question about the, the protests in, in response to the killing of George Floyd. But I really want us to be very sensitive about the fact that what is happening in each of these countries is not because of George Floyd. It is because there is an already existent system of racial dominance that is resonant with people so much that they are able to identify with it and point out cases that are almost exactly the same. And so, you know, I, I wanna just be real, real careful about people understanding why we're starting with this point Mm -hmm. Not to reify imperialism, but for us from the United States to be able to come into this conversation in an equal dialogue. So with that, Luciana, how has this conversation evolved in Brazil? Thank you very much, Chris. And so good afternoon to everybody, to all the colleagues. Uh, I think, Chris, it's really important for you to say this. And you mentioned before that how American imperialism, even the political agenda, impact the rest of the, the countries. Um, the situation of Brazil is really, as you have been probably following too, is really interesting. And I think it's uh, um, because of the fact that Brazil has 
57 of the population as black. It's really interesting how George Floyd assassination impact in Brazil and has been impact in media, has been impact in social movements, and has been impact in the politics, remembering we are in the pandemic. So, um, so many things that I don't even know how, where to start from. I will talk about the media first. No, I will talk about the black population first in general. The image of the police station burning, circulating all WhatsApp in groups of black movement, but especially in the groups of young black people who have this connect, stronger connection with social media. So the big question among the social movements, but especially a young generation who haven't seen the struggles of the black movements in Brazil. And the press, the media, is like why Afro-Brazilians don't protest like African-Americans. So this question brought a huge embarrassment to the black population in Brazil. So we are in the pandemic and everybody was like, oh, but they are under a pandemic too. They are the, you know, the center, the world the wild center of the pandemic. So are we more coward? And the media was saying, I still want to, want to understand the narrative of the media that says, that navigates between, well, maybe we are a racial democracy and our police is not as bad as the United States. Or maybe the racial problem in Brazil is because the black movement, the black population don't have the same political awareness and power of articulation that the African Americans have. So I have seen, for, for example, Rede Globo, you know, investing on this narrative that maybe the black, black population in Brazil have an incapacity to organize, to organize as the as African Americans have. Um, so I haven't been for the first time in my life talking to a lot of uh, newspapers and TV stations, even Rede Globo, and the question, and the question that they want to know in a very very simplistic way, not doing this transnational look that we are doing is why you guys don't protest like African Americans. And we are trying to every serious black intellectual, because that was the other thing that they discovered. They discovered that Brazil has black intellectuals and we can go to the TV. CNN and have the global, CNN in Brazil have been highly criticized for putting each of them two white racist journalists to comment, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the episodes in the United States. So the other thing is the agenda of discussing racism came to Brazil through George Floyd's episode. The other thing was the participation of, of white people in the anti-racist struggle, their image of uh, in Louisville of a line of white women in front of a group of black women activists is also circulating in Brazil. White people are like, oh, see how we are solidary to your struggle. And black people are like, so why you guys didn't do this here? That's, maybe that's why we don't protest in Brazil like the United States. Um, the thing is that one week before um, George Floyd was killed in the United States. A 14 years old boy was killed in Brazil. I will put his name here. Uh, I will put it later because I look for his last name, João Pedro. João Pedro was a 14 years old boy, black, from Rio de Janeiro. He was doing his quarantine inside the house of his family with all the cousins when the police attack the house, according to the police, is the same narrative always. They receive a denounce that the drug dealers entering the house of João Pedro's family. 
So the police entered in the house. In total, they shoot 70 times. And one of the bullets um, affect João Pedro in his belly. The body of João Pedro disappeared for 17, 17, 17 hours. When João Pedro was shot, the police put João Pedro inside the helicopter and his family was looking for his body for 70 hours. So he was finally found dead in, a, I don't know the name, United States, Chris, for Instituto Medico Legal, the place that they take, the, the, they do autopsy. In the, in the state morgue. Oh, thank you, Chris. Um, so all these demands about this accumulation of police brutality episodes, the last one was Juan Pedro. But last year, uh, the fact, I brought the numbers, the fact that the police brutality in Rio during the quarantine increased 43%, despite the fact that all the, any other crime during the, the quarantine decreased but the police attacks to the communities increase 43%. And one week or two before João Pedro, the police in Rio de Janeiro killed 13 boys, young black men, at once in an operation again, again against the, the drug traffic. So, uh, so this uh, the episode with George Floyd made the people go to the streets in Rio, made the people go to the street in Sao Paulo, to the streets. That is our like in the United States, that is a disproportion of the people, black people being affected by the pandemic and dying of COVID-19. We, I have said this, I know I said this in the last meeting, in my personal evaluation, we are already on the dictatorship, a 21st century model of a dictatorship in Brazil. So uh, people are also unhappy with the political crisis that this government has. It's important to say that this government has more militaries as ministers, ministers than during the dictatorship. So there is a lot of agendas together and the black movement inside all these agendas is fighting against police brutality. Just for me to, to conclude the crazy and we continue, call my attention the image of one protester in Sao Paulo among all these agendas. Uh, the Antifas is also organizing in Brazil. But this guy said in Sao Paulo after protesting he said to a black uh, crowd, to a black, uh, uh, his followers, he said, the people who came in here to march against the black genocide, we did our job, it's time to go home. So there is this concern about of the black activists of being used by all their agendas in being the front line of the police violence violence during the protest. So it's really important to point what this, what this guy said in Sao Paulo. Our struggle is over. We don't break anything. We just go home from this point. So a lot of the things are happening in Brazil in reflections in black movement, in media, um, in politics, in terms of the state and the federal government, they are completely ignoring this agenda of anti-racism. And yeah, and we can continue. Thank you. No, definitely. I think that's, you know, everything that you said is, is so important and I found myself here cringing. Um, so if, if everyone on the call was seeing me kind of purse my lips, it, 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 is, it is primarily because um, there is just so, such an intense form of violence that's happening in Brazil right now on multiple levels. And it, it, it's just, it's just un, unsettling is not a, an adequate word. I think that it's just deeply, deeply disturbing. And um, I think that one thing is, is really important for us to recognize 
are the, the political parallels between Brazil and the United States. You know, we cannot forget that Jair Bolsonaro looks up to Donald Trump. Um, and and okay. we cannot forget that he shapes his policies okay. um, based on his 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 desire for 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 to, to appease um, Trump's base. I'll put it that way. Um, and so <laughs> we have you know you, people don't necessarily realize that white supremacy in its crudest forms is also transnational. And so you have a president in Brazil that ran on a pro-torture, pro-rape, pro-police violence platform and won. And, and it, it is no accident that there is a crisis um, that Brazil has the second largest uh, pro population of, with, that's contracted COVID-19 in the country, I mean, in the world, excuse me, it's because Bolsonaro literally copied Trump's uh, policy. Hopefully. And so there's a, you know, we're starting to see these resonances and I wanna to turn to Manuchka Celeste to talk a little bit about Haiti and talk a little bit about the context, um, the context there and, 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 and how we can think about this in, in a hemispheric sense. Thank you. So I, I was listening and it was actually really helpful to hear about sort of these other places. Um, Haiti is uh, ordinarily similar, but a little bit different because Haiti is black, um, primarily black. Um, and that's, of course, where most of my understanding of race comes from. So I had a conversation with, um, with uh, a colleague and she reminded me that Haiti has been under lockdown since 2018. This comes from uh, Alexandra Sinatus. Um, and also, as I'm, I was looking through to think about the response, a colleague, um, Dr. Henson, sent me a picture of, of a few, you know, Haitians protesting in solidarity uh, with, um, with sort of the movement that's happening here, and they were burning a, a U.S. flag. Um, so the response, I think, is, is less about saying, you know, in Haiti, Black Lives Matter because most of us are Black, um, but thinking about the parallels between the ways in which Haiti's experience in relationship to U.S. imperialism, in relationship to U.N. imperialism. Uh, so it's been an interesting opportunity to think about what is, it, what is, how do we situate Haiti in this broader context, in this broader movement for understanding Black life? Um, so there are two facts that I just wanted to bring out. So in November 2019, um, uh, the Haitian police uh, arrested uh, U.S. missionaries uh, who had made it to the country um, by invitation, they said. Of course, we don't know. Um, also in 2019, um, a Haitian American who also is a former U.S. Marine is arrested by, after making it to Haiti with a load of guns, right? He flew from the US to Haiti with weapons, right? So why are you going to this lovely place where you can go to the beach and hike uh, with guns? Um, so there's always a necessity for us to think about how does what happens in Haiti, how does that relate to what happens in Canada, right? Because Canada has a lot of Haitians, right? Uh, Brazil has a lot of Haitians, but what's the relationship between Haiti and the broader black world? Um, and so one of the things I think can be helpful um, in thinking about this is, you know, Haiti itself has its own political challenges. Many of them are class. Many of them are gendered. Many of them are about thinking through how power functions, right? But many of those issues are also, and this comes from sociologist uh, Kyle Charles, uh, many of them are also tied into sort of this dual internal and external. So thinking about Floyd and thinking about sort of that image of a, uh, a flag burning um, is also a critique, right? It's really a critique of, of for us thinking about how do these other entities that are outside of us impact how we function? Um, how, how is it possible that another government can send people to kill someone else's people, right? Um, and that's a part of why, um, why this conversation has to be transnational. Um, Haitians were taken to the streets day after day after day after day, 2018, 2019, beginning of 2020, um, asking for the most basic things, right? A livable wage. Um, and a part of uh, the pushback 
is internal, right? Because uh, states serve the people with power within those states, but they were also external. People were annoyed by the fact that there were protests in another country. Um, the news coverage got really bored of Haiti's protests. Um, people started getting killed at their protests, right? And so when we think about people getting killed at a protest that's asking for something very basic, right? Uh, black life mattering, right? Or the right to eat or the right to feed your kids or access, um, access to some of the basics. Why are people getting killed when you're asking for some of the basics? Um, how does a government, right? So we don't know who the killers are, who the shooters are, who the gangs are, but we can think about all of the times that you, uh, that foreign interventions have impacted peaceful movements, right? We saw all of the um, protests here uh, where random people were breaking windows, right? And they were not a part of the core uh, of, of the movement. Um, and so that's a part of what's been helpful, thinking about Haiti in relationship um, to this broader struggle for Black liberation. It's always been a part of that conversation. Um, and it's going to continue to be a part of the conversation. But I, I want to anchor any most of my questions about Haiti uh, in the context of, of, of our relationship to foreign white supremacist entities, right? The United Nations um, has uh, done peacekeeping efforts. I say this not like it wasn't peacekeeping. Um, and now we're learning about how much rape, right, and pillaging that this peacekeeping organization did uh, in this country. We're learning about the fact that they do it with impunity. Um, and so as we're talking about George Floyd, um, we should also be thinking about, okay, what are the ways that all of these entities have across the hemisphere impacted the viability of Black life? No, I think that that's a really important point. And I think the case of Haiti in particular um, really underscores why we have to push back against this very, um, this very problematic uh, narrative that policing and anti-Black policing is an issue that is a national issue. Um, and I think that that is one of the great fallacies of the conversation. Um, I, I, you know, like I'm sure all of you, we all have been contacted by media and been talking about this for the past two weeks. And I think one of the questions that people always ask me um, is, okay, well, you know, what are the parallels? I do my work in Brazil. So what are the parallels between Brazil and the United States? And I think that, that that line of questioning fails to recognize that policing, anti-Black policing is a transnational project, um, just like white supremacy is a transnational project. And so to, to think about it as a project, as a problem that emerges from national context allows us to gloss over Haiti um, because Haiti is a Black country, not recognizing that that, that international project of white supremacy and occupation is also policing and is also a policing form of white supremacy that is parallel to what happened to, in Minneapolis and parallel to what's happening in Rio, parallel to what's happening in Paris. And so just because they're peacekeeping forces doesn't mean that's not policing and doesn't mean it's not emerging from a structure of white supremacy. And so I think that that's such a fascinating conversation to have because it really does push the conversation way beyond, way far beyond the mainstream media's digestion of the problem. Um, and, and, and that to me, you know, all of you all have touched really beautifully on some of the specificities of the issues in your respective countries. Um, and I wanna make sure that we're able to touch on that, but I, I want us to go back. And in addition to touching on those specificities, I want you all to, I, I would like, for us to also bring in this question of gender. Um, and I was really deliberate with my words at the beginning by talking about the protests against the death of George Floyd, because yes, we are talking about Breonna Taylor, but then again, no, we're not. And we all know that the reason why there has been this groundswell is because we tend to have a groundswell around the deaths of black men, but not around the killings of black women. 
and 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 there has not been the groundswell around Breonna Taylor. In fact, I have seen it as more of a tack on to the conversation, um, it, as opposed to a true and deep investment in really trying to understand how gender factors into this conversation. And I know, particularly with the cases in, with the case in Canada, you're talking about a black woman, a black and indigenous, indigenous woman, right? Um, so, two things: can you talk a little bit more um, about the specificities of what's going on in each of your your respective nations, and also how gender factors into that. Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, I think, you know, right away when uh, what happened uh, in, the, in America happened, the, the Canadian me media uh, started contacting me asking for comment on what had happened to George Floyd and to uh, on, the, on the protests, the resulting protests. And I uh, immediately responded to say, look, are you also going to be talking about Regis korczynski Paquette? Because this is something that you need to talk about here. And the, the very first place that, respond, that uh, sent me that request, which is our national broadcaster, the Canadian Broadcast uh, Corporation, CBC, responded back and said, in fact, we're interested in talking about American racism. And so we will not have time to discuss Regis Kortinsky Paquette or Brianna Taylor, which was very interesting because I did not mention Brianna Taylor. That and they said that mm -hmm, they said that they wanted to focus on American racism mm -hmm. and mentioned that they did not have time for Brianna Taylor. And I should also mention, you know, like there's been very little discussion about Tony McDade, who is uh, a trans man who was also killed around the same period. And so, you know, we struggle very much so with the same issue. Um, I, the, Canada is now forced to discuss Regis korczynski Paquette because every single Black person who has been asked to comment in the media has brought up her name and is refusing uh, to let the media uh, um, ignore it. But if you, if you watch what's happening, um, on our television screens. You'll see the, you know, the, I can't remember what those things are called, the little title at the end of the screen. Um, it'll always say George Floyd. It never talks about Regis Korczynski Paquette. It never talks about Breonna Taylor. It never talks about other, ish, uh, other um, incidents that have happened in our society um, uh, against women. And this is the way that Massage Noir operates um, on an international level as well as our experiences uh, with anti-Black racism are ignored even as we're speaking, even as we're speaking about it. Um, and that to me is just such a maddening experience. It, it, it's just so frustrating. You know, uh, for especially this iteration of the Black liberation movement around the world, a lot of women are the ones who are at the fore. There's a lot of trans folk who are at the fore, who are the ones who are doing the work, who are the ones who are taking the risk. And still, they cannot see us, and they refuse to see us. And it just uh, goes to show just how devalued um, our personhood, our humanity is uh, throughout the world, because this is not something that is um, specific just to Canada or the US. I'm watching this happen elsewhere as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that, you know, uh, there's so many emotions, complex emotions over the last couple of weeks. And that is something that, it, you know, it, it really tears at me. And so I have been, um, I'm glad that in Canada, you know, we all seem to be on the same page with respect to the activists that are speaking up. Every single person has been raising um, uh, this woman's name, but that is not always the case and it took us some time to get here. Absolutely. I'm glad that you shared that because, uh, I'm, you know, I wish we had another a whole session to be able to talk about how Breonna Taylor suddenly became a, a not American citizen um, in the eyes <laughs> of Canada. But I mean, I think we could wax poetic on that for a long time. Um, but I want to pass the 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 I want to pass on to to Mamfato and and to talk a little bit about France. Um, and I think that the case, you know, one of the things you mentioned um, was about Adama Traoré's uh, sister 
-hmm. and um, the fact that she's kind of been at the forefront of this movement. Um, mm -hmm. My own work looks at the impact of police violence on black women and family members as family members, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the trauma that they carry. And so could you talk a little bit more about that specific case and, 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 and her activism, but also about the context of Paris as well? Wow. Um, so it was so interesting because every little thing um, you say, Sandy, about Canada and the Regis Korshinsky packet applied to France. Like in the last week, I've been bombarded with requests for you from um, um, uh, TV channels, um, newspapers in France, France 24, Le Monde, and it's to talk about George Floyd. And actually, I'm being contact, I'm being you know contacted as someone who teaches and lives in the U.S. And they asked me to comment on the um, American situation. And this is happening at the same time that you have between forty thousand to eighty thousand young French, most of them seventy five percent of them Afro-French in the street. Um, and this is happening. You know, uh, uh, they're opposing state um, legislation on going out during the pandemic to protest and really make this visible that we are chanting the hashtags of for George Floyd, but also we have the hashtags for Ibrahim Ba, hashtagging, hashtagging for Ibrahim Taure and this for um, uh, Adama Traoré and this long list of young black male, young Arab male, French male killed by the French police. And the insistence of just grounding, de-grounding it from France and making an American situation was astounding. So after the second or third request or interview where I, I mean, I don't play the game. I mean, I will accept the interview, then make it about Adama instead. When um, interviews at the Adama part was good, I just decided to go back to what I, what I do, which is my writing article, working, um, you know, making films or, the work that I do on the internet because it's not where it's going to happen. And the case in France is really interesting. I just want to share with you one image because we always say that images are stronger than words that will help people kind of understand what is the French frame when we talk about identity and that will help you also understand the welcome, you know, the, the, the media, the way the media has been treating both the Comité Verité um, et Justice pour Adama, and also seeing us as activism that is seen like in France as, you know, it's like um, a Trojan horse. Um, she is called a, like a double agent coming to dismantle the Republic with American tools. It's, this is crazy. And I'm going to share with you one image that will help you understand what is, you know, how, how can we, how did we arrive to this state of mind? How, what is the conversation and just the conceptual framework in France around identity, citizenship, and the place of the black body. So if you follow me on the internet, you have seen this image that, I've, that I'm sure <laughs> Once, every, once a month or once every two weeks. This fresco is at the French Parliament and it's to commemorate the, the 1794 abolition of slavery. We have very, very few um, objects commemorating slavery because slavery didn't happen in France. We didn't, you know, mess with that. It's an American thing. And just again, how we create memory. When, when I was in school, I mean, we learned about slavery. For me, it's attached to Louisiana, Mississippi, not France. So we don't learn about slavery and all of a sudden we abolition. And this is how abolition is, is, um, is celebrated, is commemorated. And of course, this is wrong. So I started a campaign last year uh, with, um, with a French colleague to have this removed, not destroyed, removed. We need to put it in a museum. This cannot, you know, we cannot have blackface commemorate the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. The first response that we got was that we were crazy. We were ignorant, and this is an importation. Again, we go back to America, an importation of American political correctness. Because of one reason, the republic cannot be racist because, because we don't have race in France. So we, by using universalism and the republican construction of identity, it creates this, this um, construction where you cannot even start to have a debate around race or consequences of race, like state-sanctioned violence on racialized bodies, because race doesn't exist. End of conversation, right? And does this help you understand how in this, the conversation, I mean, it's just so far in France compared to what's happening, even in Canada or in the UK or in, or in, 
or in um, America because we are actually in start having a conversation on race to say that this is not okay because it's racist and I'm being, being called a racist for calling this out. And this is a class, the same way Asa's work is being demonized because people are calling her, you know, like, um, you know, you have all these words going out in the French media, the business of minority whining. They've seen it happen in the US, it's success in America. They want to import it here and destroy our republic. But our republic was great. It gave equality to everybody. So why do you want to import and um, state sanctioned violence? violence on racialized body as an importation. And around um, this protest that Asa started, the prime minister, and this is happening at the highest level of the state, the prime minister, um, the prefet de police, they all came out with this crazy statement saying that there is no race in the French police. None. I mean, it's not, I mean, we suspect it's zero. And this is happening in full page front page of newspapers, Le Monde, Le Figaro, Le Parisien, there is no racism in the French force. This is around um, um, June 2nd or 3rd. And a and few hours after that, around June 5th, you start having this revelation that groups of tens of thousands of police were creating groups in, on WhatsApp, on Facebook, discussing, I mean, it was just like fascism, racism, create, um, talking about, I mean, anti-black anti -black discourses, um, having to prepare for a civil war against all the, like, uh, these new immigrants who are coming to um, take over France, take over white France. So this revelation coupled with the force that Asa created with this march forced the government to open a conversation that I've been working on this topic for 15 years. I've never seen this amount of attention being given on media, in the media, but also at the highest level of the state on, on actually having the prime minister and the minister of interior acknowledge that, okay, we might have a problem, but it's still a we might have. And it's still such an uh, interesting way of finally having to open this debate because the numbers are here, the, the dead bodies are here, but again, it, and we've seen it this morning with the president saying that this is a problem with bad researchers, bad academics who have been contaminated by American ideas on race and who are bringing it here and putting it, inoculating it to Afro-French kids and kids from the Bonnier. So it's just a never ending conversation and, but at least the conversation is happening, which I know it's, it's a bad thing, but if you are you know, familiar with the French, it's, it's a huge thing for us that at least the can of warmth has been open and then now what's happening is the question that we all ask and I'll remove this because it's awful. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think that you're right, it is awful, but I think it's important for people to realize what is up in public space in France and how um, black folk in France are having to kind of deal with these kinds of everyday violences in addition to um, this heavy handed state physical violence that is also um, being kind of, you know, uh, put upon um, young folk in France. I, I know we're running close on time. And so um, we're going to have to wrap up. But quickly, I wanted to hear from Luciana and Maruchka. Um, and then uh, we're, we'll wrap up the, the panel. Okay. Luciana, you're thank muted. You so okay, thank you. I would like to go back to what you said since we have a short time, which is the concept of uh, white supremacy. Uh, I have been, can you see this image that I'm sharing? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so um, I'm saying this to say that I have been the last days in Brazilian press defending the idea that Brazil has its own way of white supremacy. We have a new model, like Kristen said, imported by, imported by from United States, like Bolsonaro has been applying all policies and white supremacist idea is the inspiration of the president and his supporters is the idea of white supremacy in the United States. 
I'm showing the first image is a protest in the, my left side of Bolsonaro supporters. Is the same model as a Ku Klux Klan protest. Um, and in the right, you guys can see now they adopted this thing of a drinking glass of milk. So most of the Brazilian population are not familiar with the symbols and what, what it means. But it's a new type of racism in Brazil, how now freely they express the alliances with white supremacists' ideas. But I also uh, would like to show, I'm sorry, I'm really confused with this. Okay, I would like to show the second example of white supremacy, Brazilian white supremacy that I have been using because often people say, oh, but we didn't have, did the image change? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, often people say, oh, but we didn't have those Jim Crow laws. But the, I have been saying that the same concept that some people are more advanced and more human than others have been using in Brazil in now particular type of uh, white supremacy ideas. I would like to bring it to you guys this really sad episode that happened this week and I use it to explain how white supremacy works in Brazil. This, and I have, a, I want to talk about, go back to this point, Kristen, that you will talk, the you ask about how gender has been involved in all the situations, all the my participations in media that I mentioned, Brian Taylor, people are like, who? You know, I said, yeah, it was March 13. Nobody in the media, Brazilian media, know who she was. But also I would like to go back to the situation of domestic workers who are suffering from the, this pandemic since the beginning in Brazil. So this woman, Mirtes, um, she was a domestic worker for this woman, Seri Gaspar Costa Real. So she worked as a domestic worker since the, during the whole pandemic, not only Mirtes, but also her mother. Um, the last week, she remembered that in Brazil, like, like most of the cities in the world, the schools and the daycares are closed. So she had to take her son, the little Miguel Otavio, five years old, to her job at Sari's house. And during the time that she was manicuring, and during the time that Mirtes was told to take the dogs out to shit, uh, Miguel Otavio insisted to see his mom, and he entered in the elevator several times insisting that he wanted to see his mom. In one of the times, she gave up of bringing Miguel Otavio back to the apartment. She abandoned Miguel Otavio alone inside the elevator, and he, she pressed the, the, the top floor of the building. What happened is that Miguel Otavio, uh, the door of the elevator opened in the 90th floor. Miguel Otavio went to the air conditioner area and he fell from the 90th floor. The police calculate like 35 meters. Mirtes, uh, this woman, the domestic worker, when she came back from the, to, from the walk with the dogs, she um, found out was the first to find out that her son fell from the ninth floor of the apartment. Um, so a lot of the things, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to share this episode with you guys. I know it's really sad. I, my son is five years old too, and I have been crying a lot because of this episode. Um, but I have been saying, what makes her, this woman, leave a five-year-old black boy inside an elevator by himself, assuming all the risks of what can happen, and make this whole three generations of this family working for her during the pandemic this is also the idea of white supremacy. It's not only people, the president drinking a glass of milk, or the ultra-conservative protesters doing the KKK, Brazilian KKK performance, but this type of way that has been costing the lives of, of domestic workers and their families, I would like to include that this family was infected over COVID-19 
by the employee family uh, is also a way of white supremacy. And I, what this is said, more said about all this is that this episode reveal how domestic workers during the, the pandemic have been vulnerable. And they keep students, they don't have a school, they care to be, you know, safe in appropriate space. This tragic episode to me expressed, Kristen, how gender, class, because it's the category who is the, which is the bottom of the workers in Brazil, the domestic workers. And also uh, race has been expressed in this moment that we are uh, living in Brazil and in this episode. Thank you. Thank you, Luciana. The, the story of Miguel uh, is horrifying. Um, and gut-wrenching, particularly for those of us who are mothers, I think. Um, um, you know, you know, I have two kids as well, seven and nine, and it is just devastating. Um, all the stories are devastating, but I think that it's important that you bring this story into this conversation because it reminds us that what we're talking about is not one form of violence, but what Patricia Hill Collins would call a matrix of violence. Um, and if we understand it as a matrix of violence, then we recognize that you, Miguel's story is not a story that is separate from George Floyd's, from Breonna Taylor's, from Adama Tare's, from the sister in Canada. There, there's not, th these stories are all very interconnected. Um, I wanna, we're gonna have to close our panel and go to Q&A, but I wanna close with Manuchka Celeste, um, and, and then we're gonna take questions. I can be brief because I think much of what's already been said is, is really important. I appreciate being able to think about class and gender. Um, and so for people who are not familiar with, you know, Haitian history or, or Haitian diasporic history, um, one place to start. So I teach the book Kukak, um, to my undergrads. Um, and Duntika does this thing where she talks about Anna Kanoa, right, who is the, uh, the queen of, of, of the island, right? And when col colonizers come, the first thing they do is rape and kill her. Um, and so hearing about uh, the ways in which uh, women's bodies become sites for violence, um, it's also a site for colonial violence. And so, uh, Luciana, when you were speaking about the uptick of uh, police violence during COVID, right, this is just a reflection of the ways in which we are in, in an um, abusive relationship with the state. Um, and for the state to assert control, it's typically over our bodies. Um, and so that's no different in, 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 in most countries. Uh, there are organizations, I think it's important to also name them. So Lumbee Fund in Haiti does a lot of work um, with, uh, with people who are left out um, and experience extra violence because of this. And so I think if people, again, don't know Haiti, don't know um, uh, that we have a long legacy of Haitian feminism who, are, who have been fighting both poverty um, and sexism at the same time um, and imperialism, right? We, all of it at the same time. I think it's important to tap into uh, those organizations. So that's one of them that I would really recommend for people to, um, uh, to tap into, but also to know that in all of our respective countries, um, there's always been uh, resistance by women um, across classes, but specifically women who are working um, uh, for, again, our basic dignity, our basic uh, humanity, and for us to, as we're thinking about how do we support Black women in this moment, to tap into local, long-established uh, feminist movements that have been doing this work on the ground in these countries. Absolutely, and I think that's a perfect place for us to open it for question and answer. Um, one of the things that I will also ask us to do is if you have uh, organizations in your respective, from your respective spaces that folks should be aware of and supporting, if y'all could put them in the chat, that would, be, uh, that would be wonderful because that way we can really build um, momentum for transnational solidarity and people can start to follow them if they're on Twitter or wherever their social media is and also just kind of support their work with donations or whatever that people feel moved to do. Um, so let's go ahead and do that to make sure that the conversation goes beyond the now. 
So I'm looking at the question and answer. Let's see. I know Lori Lambert is helping us kind of moderate things. Um, and Lori, if you're there, if, if there are questions that I'm not seeing, uh, it, okay, then um, just let me know. One of the things, um, while we're waiting for questions, I, you know, I was really struck uh, by the fact that we started talking about the ways that Black women have been leading this movement for quite some time. And um, I think that that's something that's also been lost in the conversation. Um, the, the, the protagonism of the, this radical moment, um, all of the demands that are being made, um, particularly around defunding the police in the United States come from Black feminist abolitionists. And we need to recognize that and we should recognize the genealogy of that thought um, and just as Black feminist abolitionists are at the forefront here, um, there are similarly Black women who are at the forefront in all of the countries that we've talked about today. Um, there's a question over here and I'm gonna try to find it. Um, okay. So the question is from Ashley asking, um, thank you to everyone on this deeply important panel in solidarity from Chicago and Mexico as well. Dr. Celeste, can you please say the name of the book you mentioned that you teach to your class? Mm -hmm. And then a second question from Ben Talton, Benjamin Talton to the entire panel. What are recommendations for next steps beyond donating to organizations? Are there strategies for international transnational solidarity? So the book is quick question. I just put it in the chat box. Um, but Duncica is Haitian born uh, diasporic author. And so her anything by her is kind of phenomenal. But also there are scholars in Haiti, uh, Haitian women feminist scholars who are writing. Uh, Dr. Uh, Menard, I'll put her name in the box is actually writing a book about um, Haitian feminism in literature. So um, read the work from the people who are living the experience um, and support them in that way. But I'll put the name, uh, the names of these authors in the chat box for you. The other question that was Ben Talton's. I mean, I think that, um, so I grew up, I'm French and Senegalese. And in my French life, I grew up in this bubble, right? This, um, we call it the, uh, the myth republicain, the myth universalist, this universal tale that told me that I'm, I'm equal, I'm equal, I don't know, I mean, everybody's equal, right? And then things happen very early in your life where you re realize that actually you're not, but there's nothing in our vocabulary, there's nothing, um, you are nowhere but you're everywhere at the same time. And it's really maddening when you have um, this feeling of displacement, this feeling of not belonging, but nothing is in your environment. And that is violence, right? Nothing in your environment explains what, what this feeling is, is, where it's coming from. And because, you know, race, your difference, what makes you visibly different has been erased from our national vocabulary. Everything is fine. And really, and this is really interesting, I was reborn when I was in the U.S., when I realized that this feeling that I could not on had a name and that people had been researching it and even though it was in another country it was in a you know in another national arena it was really close to what I've been feeling growing up and not being able to put, put a finger on it and I was able to come back and you know kind of have the boomerang of now that they have this you know started with these tools let me go back and see how I can anchor this home anchor at home. And it resonates with what Sandy was saying, because I'm listening to her and so many of the things that she said, you know, apply to France. I could just re basically redact the name out, put the name of our, you know, Emmanuel Macron and Adam Atawe, and you have the same story. And this is why it's very interesting. It's very interesting. It's absolutely important for us to be sharing these names, share these stories, because the, for us, I mean, actually for person, the biggest trap that I see is making it a national issue. So violence on the, against black bodies is, a, is an American issue. Um, it's an issue from, you know, 
Brazil. It's an issue in South Africa, but it's not a problem with us. And then not realizing yourself from understanding something that is extremely important which is that this is a project it's a transnational project and white supremacy works in france the same way it operates in in, in belgium the same way it operates in switzerland and it's been extremely interesting to see this past week in I mean, state statues being toppled. We, I mean, I see France in um, Belgium, for example, who've had conversations for 30 years over the statues of Leopold II, who I have no idea why this person is no, not, not known as much as Adolf Hitler is known. And nobody's listening to them. You're being um, vilified, called a crazy person, racist. And then all of a sudden, with one thing happening in Bristol, is contaminated, you know, uh, give people the strength in, in Belgium and in Ghana and in Genève. So it's very, it's, it's Adam, I mean, it's important that we have this conversation, that we share these names, that we share this experience, knowing that we're not talking about national occurrences, but this is a global project that need a global, like a transnational um, answer, response or tax, task, task force. I, I think absolutely. We have another question um, that's in the queue here, and this is for Mamfato. What are the types of demands coming from people in the BLM protest in Paris, especially in response um, to you saying that France doesn't see race? And so that's actually, that's a question. Can I, can I also just kind of expand on um, the question? This is from Alexis Kirsch, Kirsch? Um, and let's expand upon it. And what are the demands in each of your spaces? Like, what is it that people are specifically asking for um, in in each of your national spaces? But let's start with let's start with Mam Fato. So again, the bar is so low for us that our first demand is: Can we say black? And actually, can we can we say noir? Ciao. Can we say noir? Black, because black means that, I mean, it's, it's the problem. It's all the problem that come with blackness. It's the violence against black body. And again, it's, it's not us. It's not us. And bringing this conversation, saying that Adama was killed. I mean, Asa, um, Asa was indicted for saying that her brother was killed because he's black. She is not allowed to say that. Would have been killed if he was white? No. He was killed because he's black, but you're not allowed to say it. So can we say noir? Can we say what happened to you if you're black? Can we explain why it's black bodies, black male bodies and Arab bodies that are being killed? Can we say black? Can we open the conversation about race without being accused like it was the case this morning by the president of this country of being racist and of creating a secessionist war? Can we say black? Can we say noir? I mean, our bar is so low, guys. <laughs> that is so powerful. That is so, but no, Manushka, I want to go to you. I just yeah. wanted to say really quickly, that's so powerful. I, I wanted to have a war of the low bars. Can we have a livable wage? Don't try me, Aiti. <laughs> can we have a livable wage? We, let's cut, let's, and I think also, can y'all leave us alone with our elections? Can you all stop interfering and in placing presidents we didn't vote for in power? This is basics 101, and <laughs> I appreciate it. It puts everything in perspective. Sandy and Luciana, what are, what are, your, what are the things that, that folk are wanting in Canada and Brazil? Big time for us is defunding the police. You know, we're seeing uh, the decision that came through in Minneapolis and people are, uh, you know, very encouraged by that. A lot of discussion has been happening nationally about what defunding the police would look like, how we can reinvest in social programs that uh, value our humanity. Um, so, so that's one. Another big one is getting cops out of schools. I don't know if other uh, jurisdictions have trouble with this. I know Americans uh, do for sure, but there are police in our schools and it's not in every school. It's like in the schools where there are more black students and so, we're trying to get cops out of schools and uh, as well to create uh, new emergency mental health resources because a lot of the police killings that are happening happen when someone is having some sort of mental distress. They call the only emergency place they could call 911 for help. Police show up with the power to kill you how many times over. And instead of de-escalating and providing the health supports that people need, they kill them. 
especially if they're black. And so, you know, we're like, why is that the only option to call if you're having some sort of emergency? Uh, there should be something else. And so a lot of people have joined that call as well. So that's what people are really, really demanding out on these streets out here. That's so helpful. And it's, it's extremely helpful for us to recognize. I think I've seen so many jokes on Twitter from folk who have nothing, have no concept of Canada whatsoever, um, who assume that Canada doesn't have these problems. And literally every single point that you made, as you well know, because you're from BLM, but every single point that you just made is the same exact points that we're making here. I mean, and so it, Canada is not an exception, y'all. It's not what Michael Moore told us it was. <laughs> Luciana, um, why don't you talk a little bit about Brazil? And then we're gonna have to close it up and I want to close it up with that final question. And maybe Luciana, you can tie this in to your um, comment on what pe people want in Brazil as well. Um, and that, and that is, the, and there's a couple, there's a, a longer question here, but we're, unfortunately we're not going to be able to get to it. But the, the, the question is, you know, can, can transnationalizing the, the dialogue um, help? in this moment and how can it help? I think I'll add that that last part was me spinning it. Um, and that was, that's a question from Julia Bella Trindagi. I, it's Brazilian or it's not. And I just pronounce everything like it's Portuguese. So my apologies, <laughs> that's not right. Um, so, so that question, um, can we tie that into our closing remarks and starting with Luciana? But Luciana, can you also say what do people in Brazil want? Well, um, right now in Brazil, uh, people are demanding the, also starting to debate the destruction of the statues, especially of the slave traders. So, and uh, uh, we have a lot of slave uh, traders uh, images here in Bahia particularly. So people are having this debate and I know it's, it seems to be, it's a debate that already happened in the United States years ago, now it's strong again, so now we are debating this in Brazil. Um, we are also debating the end of the police brutality in Brazil, but it is still a really superficial debate. I have been saying, I have seen that we, the concept of civil rights in Brazil is really new. We don't have the idea of a civil rights. The, the, for example, I'm putting African American community because that's what people are comparing now. Um, although the black movement in Brazil was created during the dictatorship and the struggle for democracy kind of a cover, they struggle against racism a lot. It's really difficult in Brazil to make the, the demand, the public agenda against the racism, a public agenda, agenda of all Afro-Brazilians. So it's really new idea of the civil rights. So we, we are, what I can tell is that we are doing this debate over um, stopping br police brutality, but it's still without defunding the police. We don't reach this level of knowing how we can um, make the, you know, the, the stool of a controlling bad guys weak. So we are demanding the stop of police brutality. We are demanding democracy, since he, we are living in an authoritative state. Uh, the black people in Brazil, they organize the tech black people because workers are so just surviving, are uh, demanding the release of the numbers of the black people who are dying of COVID-19, this data were suspended by the Ministry of Health. So we knew this information incomplete some weeks ago, now we don't anymore, they will not release this information anymore. So now we, Afro-Brazilians organized wants to know the numbers of black people who are dying and getting sick of COVID-19. Um, about the question, uh, uh, of how a transnational uh, agenda against the racism may help. I, I absolutely, this is my hope that we reach a level that we can transnationally debate how in the Americas uh, races in the post-slavery societies 
how white supremacy adapted to each society to do the same uh, purpose, the same goal to leverage people, to separate the people, to create a hierarchy of the people based on gender, skin color, and class. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we're out of time. Just maybe in like one second chorus, what can transnationalizing the debate help us with? I'll say one and a half sentences. Um, to remember that the Black struggle has always been global. Um, what happens to Black people in the US, in the Caribbean, on the continent, in Europe, um, all of that has always been about us understanding our connections to each other. So our liberations uh, are tied to each other. So paying attention to what happens in the US to Black people, but also what's happening to Black people in other countries as it's related to global capitalism and colonialism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it helps us um, understand what's happening today, but also, I mean, I know that I've been, I was very galvanized when I realized that I was not inventing anything, that the people who were around me were not inventing anything, but we were just transforming actions, creating words that were, had a long genealogy. And I think that, that just having that perspective that, you know, you are engaged in action that were, you know, that ancestors, that people who come before you had been engaging with, but also that people, you know, who are living the same moment than, than you, um, whether it's in Poho Pass or in Accra, or, um, you know, asking the same question, going through the same struggle, it really helps. So I think that for me, I mean, I'm talking really, in my own line of work, having this transnational perspective had been liberating both at the mental, you know, this not have this whole weight on my own shoulder, but understanding that our struggle has always been global and that we're not alone in this. It's liberating. <laughs> I'll say that um, I think that it's very important for us to, to understand uh, the way that colonialism continues to impact uh, anti-blackness across uh, the borders as well. I mean, just one example of, of how expanding our knowledge beyond borders um, can be useful is that uh, in Canada, because there's a, a lower population of black people and a higher population of indigenous people, we're often talking about the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women. In the United States, there's a higher population of black people and a lower population of indigenous people, and they're often talking about the issue of murdered and missing black people. Why wouldn't we be talking about this issue across the borders? Because this issue crosses borders. We should be talking about missing and murdered black women throughout the Americas throughout Europe, because those issues are all connected. We should be talking about police brutality, not just of how many people are killed, how many black people are killed in a day in America, but how many black people are killed in a day around the world so that we understand that these issues are interconnected and are anti-black institutions that exist far beyond our borders. Because if we just keep focusing just within our borders, we are not going to solve these problems because they exist and have been constructed outside of them. Absolutely. I think on that note, we're going to end our session. I, I know I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone on the call learned a lot as well. I just want to say thank you to each of you. Um, good luck with all of the liberation work that you're doing right now. And thank you so much. It was great meeting you all. It starts Thank with you. us. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank You're a fabulous you. course. Thank, Thank you, ladies. And I'm Thank looking forward so to much. real life. <laughs> I, I know, right? We have to yeah. get, get, get together. Take care. Thank Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.